We pride ourselves on the, the results of the impressive uh, companies we work with. And so I thought I'd just take a quick moment. Some of our recent client successes are Splunk uh, and their IPO. We were very early on with them. Rocket Fuel, uh, recent success, FireEye. Some of you may know them. Uh, Tableau, uh, MoPub, Involver, OpenX, Pubmatic, a long, long list of great companies. Uh, and opportunities like this give us a, a platform to share that with entrepreneurs, those who are innovating in this market, and investors. So I thank you for that uh, quick infomercial. If you'd like to take a look at us, it's vantagepartners.net. Feel free to take a look, and if you have any questions for me, feel free to give me a call. Uh, we've got a great panel. Uh, talking about a very relevant topic, uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Naveen and let him introduce the moderator. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for being on our class. Um, so now, um, we this today's event is quite unique. Usually, our events are they start at six to seven for dinner and networking, and then we have one panel. And but today, the creator of this awesome event is those two awesome people. <laughs> Shruti and Vipin. Vipin, they are the co-chairs of our mobile um, uh, program for Thai so around the year. Uh, they hold, they have already had another event only a few months ago, so usually they try to hold three to four events. So uh, they are again volunteers, uh, highly successful. Vipin is a serial entrepreneur, recently sold his company to Nook, he's a VP of product management there. And then Shruti does corporate uh, venture investments at Samsung, so those who need money, don't let her get out of here. <laughs> How many of you are looking for money? <coughs> All right, there is your target. Okay, with that, I would like to, so uh, let's give them a big round of applause for putting together an awesome panel. And of course, to our awesome panelists for coming here in the traffic and uh, going to provide us their wisdom, so get ready. So we have a busy evening. Uh, we'll start with a panel on mobile media, where we will discuss uh, the trends in mobile content authoring, distribution, consumption, and monetization. Uh, we'll break after this panel for dinner and networking, and the bar will be open at that time. Uh, at 7 p.m., we will come back and resume with our second panel of this evening on mobile commerce, where we will explore the trends in mobile retailing and payment. And this being the holiday season and Black Friday weekend, it's very relevant. And by the way, online was awesome uh, in the last three days. It, it broke all the records, 40% uh, growth uh, from last year. So it's a tremendous uh, uh, topic. And we will conclude with uh, a one-on-one -on -one chat with an entrepreneur who recently sold his company to Google. So that is the format, uh, and we will be done by 8.30, but this is going to be uh, a very exciting next few hours. So with that, uh, let me invite uh, the moderator for our, for our first panel, Raj Golamudi, a director at Intel Capital. Uh, Raj uh, makes investment in everything mobile for Intel, from content to commerce to infrastructure. Uh, and he brings a ton of experience uh, in the space, not only at Intel, but also from Omidia Networks, where he led their mobile investment in emerging markets, and Blue Stream Ventures, which was a $300 million venture firm which he co-founded in 2000. So without further ado, let me invite Raj to moderate our first panel. Thank you very much, Vipin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm looking, actually, looking forward to learning a lot from my panelists. And uh, Vipin's done a fantastic job. Vipin has done a fantastic job of putting together a group of people who bring a really rich, diverse um, background. So, uh, so let me just have everybody come up to stage, and uh, we'll just uh, have them introduce themselves, and then we'll kick off the rest. So John Drury. I'm John Drury, I'm from a startup called Avarail. It's a couple year old startup. We're in the mobile content management space. Uh, we focus on delivering 
um, business documents to mobile employees on their, on their devices, regardless of where that content's actually stored. So we're a federated solution, allows people to store things both on the cloud uh, and on-prem, and to truly enable that on mobile devices. I'm Abhinay Shraina, founder and CEO of Long Slice. Uh, very young company right now. Prior to this, I spent about 20 years working in the retail e-commerce and mobile space, most recently as CIO for restoration hardware. So for me, the entrepreneurship thing is a little bit new. I'm still settling in. <laughs> and Plum Slice, we, we, we are focused primarily around product management for retail e-commerce and mobile space, primarily for retailers, retailers. And uh, there's obviously content creation, governance, and distribution as part of that. I'm uh, Raj, number one. <laughs> uh, I work with a company called Tempo AI. Uh, we uh, incubated at SRI, which is Stanford Research Institute. Uh, SRI has invented a number of things like the mouse, but most recently was famous for Siri, uh, which is part of Apple, so we're thinking a lot about what next generation of systems might be like uh, in a very Google Now kind of way, uh, and sort of pre-Google Now. Uh, and so we built something called Tempo Smart Calendar, and we like to say it uh, uh, looks like a calendar but feels like an assistant. Uh, so looking at how we can leverage your calendar data uh, to uh, try to be more anticipatory and proactive uh, throughout your day. I'm another Raj, Raj Lalwani. I'm a co-founder and CEO of a startup called Bitcovery. Bitcovery is discovery of bits, which is discovery of digital content, eBooks, music, apps. Uh, we recently launched at the TechCrunch Disrupt Battle Team, so we were one of the 30 companies who were chosen. Uh, so it's been only a couple of months. Um, our unique angle is basically the two uh, uh, places from where people discover most of the content. Uh, one, experts uh, through blogs and reviews, and second, friends. So that's what the company focuses on. Great, thanks. So I wanted to keep the introductions uh, relatively brief, and then we can talk. I just want to get into some discussion and some detail around what are the major trends, what are, what are uh, the entrepreneurs that are sitting here thinking about, what are the issues that they're struggling with, what are the trends that they're seeing, uh, and so on and so forth. So maybe I'll start at, with a high level uh, statement and set up a framework where, you know, when you think of uh, media, obviously content is a big, big part of media, and so I just want to spend some time uh, talking about content from the various perspectives that we have on the panel here. And, and I'll start with John because his company it really is all about content, and one of the things that is happening in the in the enterprise market is the proliferation of devices. People are bringing all kinds of devices into the market, and enterprises are trying to figure out what to do with them, you know, manage them, control them, and so on and so forth. So maybe John, just a, uh, a little bit of education and then a little bit of um, uh, insights on when you talk to potential prospects, customers of yours, what are the issues that come up? And uh, maybe just even before that, what led you to, to found this company? What problems did you run into that said, okay, here's a problem that's worth solving, that's big enough, that isn't being addressed? Sure, thank you. Um, let me start with the sort of the little bit of the history lesson. So, so we started the company in 2011 uh, time frame, which was post iPad, post iPhone, um, and what we saw was a whole new wave of, of devices going inside of, of corporations. Um, for many companies, this was really a transition away from BlackBerry, um, and it was probably the first major wave to cut across all um, user populations in many companies to where they really were using smartphones and smart devices. Um, what we saw was, as part of this, was sort of layering of the problem sets that companies were struggling with. And, and a lot of this came from before we ever wrote a line of code, before we actually started developing the solution, we spent a lot of time just researching and talking to companies. Most of these were very large companies, multinationals, um, just about how they were using those new devices inside their organizations. And not surprisingly in that time frame, most of them were just trying to replace the Blackberry. So it was all about email, contacts, calendar, and just basic productivity apps. So it was individuals using some app they downloaded from one of the app stores onto the device so they could help them with tip calculation or expense calculations, those types of things. They really weren't integrating into the larger organization. Um, but as we spent a lot of time talking to companies, one of the, the problems that we, we saw and, and heard about more and more frequently was, how do I get to my company content? Um, how do I get all the stuff that I need during the day uh, to do my job? Um, not just my personal content, but 
all of the, the shared content that we, we use throughout the organization uh, to, to move the business forward, to either sell to customers, to coordinate across operations, uh, all the planning documents, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. And, and it turns out that it's a very difficult problem. So there have been content management players, whether they be Microsoft or you know, Documentum, Fresco, and a number of other companies have solved this through other ways and on different platforms. They really hadn't addressed adequately the mobile side of this problem. And as you look at this from a mobile first perspective, what you find is there, there are many more challenges than you even have on the desktop, where, where largely the problems have been solved by, by providing a web-based interface to the content management systems. In our case, you have just the, the natural ergonomic challenges of trying to access many different things in many different places from a mobile device, which is limited in its own right. You have all the UX problems of this isn't a browser, this sometimes is connected, sometimes not connected. Um, and so as we spoke to people, we found that there were just layers of this content problem. Some were around consumption, some were around discovery, some were around just the federation of content connecting to it in different places. Um, there are a whole range of usability and user issues. Users had expectations because they'd been adopting a lot of the consumer technologies and the consumer apps, and they wanted that same experience in the in the uh, in their corporate enterprise apps. And then on the back end, you have all the companies who are just wringing their hands uh, about what to do with all the content because they had the content on the back end, but they were very very reluctant to open up access to it um, because once it's in the wild, you know lose these devices, there is no uh, consistent security mechanism, there's no secure, there's no consistent audit mechanism to keep track of where the documents are at any given time, and the list goes on and on and on. So what we found ultimately was there's really a two-part problem. There's a set of problems around the user experience and what the users expect from keeping it simple and usable from a day-to-day -day experience so they can do their job, and on the other side, a whole series of enterprise problems around security and control uh, and auditing of the content as it moves around the organization. So that's really that's really sort of how we came at the problem, and it's sort of the structure of the problem uh, as we as we look to tackle it. Yeah, thanks. Sir. And then at least to you, so when you uh, you know your your company and your business is focused on uh, content again, so from a very sort of commerce centered view and very product centered view, so can you talk a little bit about when you think about sure. content and sharing of content, access to content? How how does that Sure, absolutely. So in retail, as I think most of you know, uh, there was a shift from single channel, which was the retail brick and mortar store and catalog to some extent, to e-commerce, right? So that came known as multi-channel. So now there's mobile, there's social commerce. And traditional, what I would say, infrastructure within organization is very siloed today, even today. Because companies build, even today, they're building separate mobile teams, even the and from business lines perspective, they are separate uh, units. So, but what we the, the what we saw was customers interact with brands. They don't interact with channels, uh, and they expect a consistent and seamless experience regardless of the channel they are communicating with. And so that's what's given it's given birth to what the retail industry is calling is omni-channel. So regardless of which channel you interact with, if you're surfing on the website, you left left someplace. Uh, consumers, omni-channel consumers now expect to pick that up regardless of at the same place, regardless of which cha channel they're using to interact. So what that gave, sort of that, what that's doing is, and especially mobile as it's coming into play, it's, 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 it's breaking those barriers and it's breaking those silos and obviously content, specifically product content. Uh, and as omni-channel has been sort of coming into play, at the same time, there are multiple marketplaces that have been popping up. Uh, obviously, Amazon, eBay have been there for a while, Alibaba, Etsy. If you look into Asia, there are industry-specific and region-specific marketplaces that are popping up. So when you think about it from that perspective, the product data governance and product content governance becomes a big issue. So that's, that's core of, now we do other things around product management, uh, but that was the core issue that we sort of started looking at specifically from a mobile perspective because there are companies that are outsourcing different pieces of this product data governance, whether it is making sure that the descriptions are right, they come up on uh, Google Shopping, right? 
uh, and when people are uh, searching for stuff from, from submissions to search engines to these different marketplaces and to different consumers, uh, and mobile then becomes a separate of its own. And as John mentioned, uh, it's not been integrated well into the traditional, uh, what I would say, organizational structures that they've had. Uh, so there was one problem we looked at. Uh, so mobile as well as product data, content, creation, governance, and, and distribution aspects. The second thing we looked at was along the lines of staying focused on around product management for retailers and e-commerce providers, uh, uh, enterprise productivity. So whether you're working with suppliers, even small companies today work with, uh, I know companies that are like two people companies and they're working with suppliers in, in India, China, Malaysia. So they're managing that back and forth with the suppliers, uh, that's always been a bit. Uh, so that's through some uh, web as well as uh, mobile apps. We are trying to address that through collaboration apps. And the third issue for us was uh, bringing consumer engagement uh, upstream in the cycle. Today, a lot of review sites, obviously companies, most retailers have their own reviews, uh, reviews on their own sites. Uh, but all those reviews and customer feedback comes after the product is in the market. So what we are proposing is uh, before the product and during design, development, and selection. And there was a recent study by McKinsey where they looked at three companies that, that did this manually, where they threw certain designs at consumers. And again, it was focused to a lot of companies don't want to open up their products during design cycles. So uh, it's not just about using social media, it's about basically making sure that the relevant customer feedback is incorporated upstream, and then that feedback is used not just to design and develop, but also in, in making decisions on how much inventory to have in which part of the country. So those were the like around, everything's enveloped around product management, but starting with content, but those were the problems we sort of looked at when, when I was at Restoration Heart of William Sonoma and a few other companies that we worked with. And obviously with mobile coming into play, and what we are seeing is even the customers we are working with now, uh, they are, uh, mobile is now acting as, as a change agent where while it doesn't stand separately on its own, it is enabling the, other, the, the basically the consolidation of other channels, even breaking organizational structures to some sense. So one of the large retailers recently, Office Max, they recently announced they took one of their best performing executives and they made him, I think his title is now VP of Omnichannel Enablement. So e-commerce, mobile, retail, all falls under one. About 30% of retail companies now have product management teams. And what's being said is, uh, that are omnichannel, and what is being said is in the next two to three years, probably that number is gonna grow from uh, 30 to 60%. So when we look at, from our perspective, and we look at mobile and how it's enabling uh, breaking of these silos, that to us was the opportunity. So, so one thing that you touched on briefly is, uh, you know, it sounds like the this, this systems or the solutions that you built are aimed at or targeted or maybe uh, 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 suitable for big companies, but what about, what about smaller companies, medium-sized companies? Is there something, so there's more and more companies now where mobile is is their only channel. Absolutely. So what, what about those kinds of companies? So when we started out, our first pilot, our first two pilots were companies that were doing three million in revenue a year. So our whole design was based on that, but then we had to pay our bills and we are self-funded, cash flow positive enough. Mm -hmm. Cost my you don't need that. <laughs> yeah, well, I will need you some someday, not today. Uh, but. Initially when we got started, uh, so that's why when we, for, I'll give you an example. When we looked at managing product content, product data, we said there are about 400 to 500 different attributes that a product has. So every company, to your point, startup is not gonna need all those 400 to 500 attributes. With these initial companies we worked with needed 20. So when they looked at what we were designing, they said this is not for us. So we configured it, we made the whole thing configurable where you can say these are the 20 product attributes that are relevant to me and to my this one specific channel, whether it's only e-commerce or only mobile. As the companies grow, all they need to do is go into the configurator and say, okay, here are the 10 more fields. Okay, I got a new customer that is gonna accept uh, uh, substitutions or now I, I, I started a new business line that they're ready to start doing subscriptions. So with, with the scalability model, they don't have to port the data, they don't have to migrate it from one system to another. So we have customers today that are doing, and those first customers are still there, 
they're doing three billion in revenue, and we recently signed up a couple of customers who are a uh, little over three billion in revenue. So I think, but that transition was not easy. It took us a year to work through that transition. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah, switching gears slightly, so, so uh, to you, uh, Raj from Tempo. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so in, we, we heard from, from John and Avnish about so the challenges that enterprises have, right? So on big systems, enterprise, silos, data. Your company, your most recent startup, is really focused on, from what I understand, just the, what's on your phone, your device. I mean, a lot of the data that you're collecting is on the device and from the device. How do you think about the data aspect of, of what you're doing and, and being intelligent about that data and who, when, you, when you provide access to it and make it available and so on? Yeah, so um, uh, there's two kinds of content we look at. So there's, uh, to John's point, so when we started um, uh, Tempo, uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to build an assistant, and I wanted to build it for business people or for prosumers. And I was looking at a number of startups attacking the dashboard. I remember like the Uber dashboard. Uh, and as we were going down the path, we realized how custom this dashboard started to look uh, for different enterprises. It was always uh, uh, custom engineering, uh, plugging in the different pieces of infrastructure. It, it wasn't sort of a self kind of model that can just kind of organically grow on its own. And uh, as we were fleshing this out, we realized that the calendar is an excellent dashboard because uh, it's effectively a statement of what we call intent. Uh, you're telling me where you're gonna go, what you're gonna do, who you're gonna meet, where you're gonna spend your time. Uh, and so why not surface the types of things that you would expect in this sort of Uber dashboard uh, right into your calendar itself. And so that's sort of how we, uh, part of how we chose the calendars we were thinking about building this business assistant. Uh, there's two kinds of data sources that we tap into. Uh, certainly, uh, just the nature of the product, we don't tap into stuff behind firewalls and behind VPNs. We tap into stuff that we can access through OAuth. Uh, and we are increasingly seeing it's just a trend. And this is sort of motherhood and apple pie-ish. Uh, but more and more stuff is moving to the cloud, and people are becoming more and more accepting of using uh, cloud services within the SMB for sure. So whether it's Google Apps or Salesforce or whatnot, and all these services are accessible through OAuth. Uh, which makes things really, really great. So um, we're able to access that data from the cloud. But the, the key thing is, is if you have all this sort of data and you pull it together into a dashboard, you think, think about like your enterprise dashboard, it's sort of you choose an account and you pivot on an account, or you choose a person, you pivot on a person, or you choose a place, you pivot on a place. How can we sort of filter that down and just surface what you need to you? Uh, and so this is sort of riding on uh, what we increasingly are calling the anticipatory platform or anticipatory web. Uh, and this is kind of a play on Web 2.0 being the participatory platform. Uh, so Web 3.0 is sort of being more personalized and being more proactive. Uh, and so how can we intersect information or intent that we can determine about you through our understanding of the calendar, so who you're gonna meet, where you're gonna go, uh, plus location, plus time, plus what other, other, whatever other signals that we can get access to uh, to try to help determine intent to then surface the type of information that we think is most relevant to you at that time. Uh, so we think of this as sort of a macro trend. Uh, we like to say uh, assistant right now is a category, uh, but it's becoming a layer. Uh, and the analog that we use here is location in 2007 used to be a category in the App Store, uh, the carrier App Store pre-iPhone pre, pre -iPhone era. Uh, but now it's a layer, like what application doesn't leverage? Uh, location is a layer. So the same thing's happening with assistant right now. If you start thinking about your own applications, uh, right now the user enters the application, they may have to go through a few taps to get what they want, but how can you predict what they want uh, and then push that to them at the right time. Uh, and once you sort of figure out that uh, loop, then, then you kind of nailed it. And so uh, we're still in the early days of sort of figuring out assistant, and, and uh, I think you're seeing a number of folks attack it from different angles. Uh, but I think the key thing is trying to figure out how to uh, balance the noise versus precision versus recall. So you have all this information, uh, but how can I make it sort of learning for you? And increasingly interesting uh, is with the wearable phenomenon and the number of different screens that are now available between Google Glass and your TV and Internet of Things, uh, really what you have is a whole bunch of different screens to push notifications to. Uh, and so thinking about how assistant and context aware and being anticipatory plays into those notifications, because uh, maybe you know while you're driving in your car, there's a certain notification that goes up on your Google Glass, which is okay, uh, saying that there's a gas station nearby because it knows you're running low on gas, uh, but if it showed up on your phone while you're in your living room at your house, uh, well, that's kind of annoying, right? So figuring out that notification hierarchy and then how those uh, manifest itself on these different screens is all sort of playing in this broader sort of assistant anticipatory uh, area that I think is, com is coming to fruition right now. Cool. Okay. Very helpful. Uh, 
very insightful. Thank you. So, uh, last but not least, uh, Raj, let's, we started with the enterprise and now mm -hmm. finish off with uh, pure consumer focus. Right. So, tell me, tell me, so what led you've done? You've done some successful startups. Just tell me what led you to starting recovery and what are some of the problems you've seen on the consumer side? Everybody talks about you know just massive amounts of applications that are very hard to monetize. Discovery is a big challenge. Just walk us through. So what led you to start start recovery and, and how are you going about solving some of these problems that you that you see? Yeah, so I think I'm the only person here um, with a consumer facing mobile app. Um, I think uh, we all can relate to it. We are living in a world where increasingly it's not the lack of choices. It's actually too many choices, uh, whether it is apps or it is books or it's music or it's movies, anything. Uh, I remember the days basically when, we, when I was growing up in India, we used to anxiously wait for Sunday when the TV would show that one movie. And doesn't matter what movie it was, we were going to watch it. We were just curious, you know, what that movie was. Uh, it's a very different world now. We have more and more choices, and they are actually increasing every day, and we have less and less time. So I think we all need some advice somewhere, um, you know, where should I spend my time? If I'm actually going to read a book this summer or this weekend, what book that should be? Uh, so, so that's basically the problem that we were actually uh, trying to solve. and. Um, what, we, what I noticed actually is that a lot of the companies focus a lot on the trees. Uh, so there would be, uh, you know, if you're looking for an app for shopping, for example, they would show you an app for shopping. Uh, but I think uh, we all have this nagging feeling, what else is out there in shopping? Am I actually missing on, you know, a, a better application? Uh, and if I'm actually you know, uh, looking for a book on entrepreneurship, uh, what are the other books that are out there that other people actually like? Am I actually missing on that book? Am I reading the wrong one? So uh, what we are doing actually in that uh, space is uh, we look to uh, some of these uh, blogs or reviews uh, that are written. So for example, for apps, and there might be an article in Mashable or in Time Magazine, which is you know seven best apps for shopping or you know seven uh, 10 best uh, games for toddlers. Um, so we actually take those uh, reviews, we create um, some collection of apps around those. So what happens is that, so you don't have to trust us, you basically know uh, Mashable, you know Time Magazine, uh, and you say, okay, this person actually has done some reasonable research, has come up with the seven apps in shopping, and uh, I can actually see these apps, and this one actually seems more suitable for my situation, and I actually go by that. So that's, in essence, what we have done. And then the other source is uh, obviously friends. So if uh, uh, you know my friend actually tells me that I have read this book on entrepreneurship and I really like it, we tend to actually value that a lot. So these are the two uh, ways we are trying to solve the problem. Great, thank you, very, very helpful. So a uh, question that uh, will <clears throat> direct to all of you and you can choose to or, or answer in any order is, uh, you know, the cliche is mobile changes everything. And all of you, in your own way, are doing things that have been done in the previous world, whether it's content management, whether it's sort of a retail uh, product catalog management, or calendar management, or personal assistant, or you know discovery on the web, so on and so forth. You've done, you're doing things uh, that have been done before, and the bet is mobile changes that, right? So in some way, fundamentally, it, may, it changes it in a way that's big enough, fundamental enough, that the incumbents can't respond or respond to slowly. So maybe just walk us through, maybe in, in any particular order, mobile changes something. Tell us how it changes it in such a fundamental way that the, the incumbents are not able to respond or solve the needs of the customers. So I'll start. Uh, so in our space... Um, like, you know, so like, like, you know, for example, there's, yeah. there's so many, like stumble upon and so on and so right. forth, right? The idea of sort of serendipitous discovery of something. There's so many apps and websites that are focused on discovery of content where you don't really know what you're looking for, but based on previous history, cookies, so on and so forth, you now discover things that are through social graphs and so on. So what are you doing in mobile that's, that's different enough that these incumbents can't respond to? So it's yet? really interesting, actually. Discovery is, as you said, uh, looking, I mean, you're not even looking for something. Uh, uh, if you're looking for something, you can actually go do search on Google or you can do search on 
Apple App Store. Uh, how do you actually find something when you're not even looking for something? So that happens, you know, when you when your friend actually tells you something. One interesting thing that I find out about uh, mobile is um, people actually have a lot of dead time uh, when they're picking kids or when they're at a restaurant, maybe eating lunch on their own or they're in the train. And what is happening is that uh, people look to mobile apps um, as a form of killing time or using the time in a more useful manner. Um, and that's where, so you have this uh, fully functional computer uh, which is actually connected to the internet all the time. Uh, and um, there is this uh, a person who's actually writing a book on uh, how these things actually become very addictive. Uh, one thing that, uh, one reason why we actually like to look at inbox uh, very frequently is because we don't know what we're actually going to find there. So it's variable surprise uh, or variable reward. Uh, same thing with Facebook. Um, why we like to actually go to Facebook multiple times in a day is because we don't know what we're actually going to see. So those are some of the things that have tremendously affected uh, how we have actually designed our uh, product and um, how actually people use our application as uh, a form of entertainment as well as you know using their time to actually discover something. Sure. What, what, are, what, are your, what are your systems doing that traditional systems can't do or not doing? So that we, makes you uh, interesting to us. Sure. So we're not make a statement here. We're not doing anything wrong there. It's as you said, it's basic stuff. But I'll give you one example. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the large companies we're working with, when I say large, about four billion dollars in revenue. It's pretty large. Yeah. <laughs> so you would think that their processes would be sophisticated enough to they would have made they every year they make hundreds of million of dollars of investments in technology, infrastructure as well as applications. Even today, there is a certain percentage, and that percentage is pretty large, I won't get that out. They get orders from their suppliers, and other, uh, the, the communication is on faxes, not even email. It's on faxes. So what we are doing is, we are saying, okay, they're saying our suppliers are not tech savvy. They don't have systems, and some of them don't even have access to internet. So guess what? Most of them have smartphones. Even in India today, if you go or China, Malaysia, they all have smartphones. So we, we, we actually, this is in process, we're building a, a mobile app for them that can in, that can interface with our platform, and they can manage that supply back and forth with small, very small suppliers. This also answers, I think, complete answers to your previous question <laughs> uh, via this mobile app. So that's where we see enablement to do basic things that they've done in the past yeah, that have been inefficient, or you would even think of that problem today because, in my mindset, when we went in there to talk to them, assuming this is a large, very successful company that they would have at least these basic processes sorted out. And they said it's not in our control, it's our suppliers, and here's the problem, right? So that's where mobile came into play. And while it's the same process, it's the same thing, mobile is now enabling them to have access to that information a lot faster. They're taking pictures of samples, uploading them. So all that is happening with mobile apps. How about you, John? Yeah, I think, I think the big one for us is, is really around just understanding that, that mobile represents a fundamentally different use case. Um, and so a lot of the way it gets translated for us is in terms of UX. So exploring content isn't anything new. Um, for us, exploring large uh, uh, collections of content that are federated all over the place on a very limited or small screen can, be, can present a whole series of complex problems. So everything from making search easy on mobile is, is, is key to us. Uh, providing a way for IT people to pre-configure uh, different sites um, so they just automatically appear on people's mobile devices. So they sign in and, and their, their folders are already there. So the content is in the places they'll already expect it. So it's anticipating these things. It's understanding context. We, we've touched on that already. Um, and bringing that into the design. Also understanding that it, it's, you know, it's not a full-blown uh, desktop experience uh, in a browser. So you, you often have, have many other limitations you have to deal with. Um, the fact that you may not have a broadband connection uh, available to you on mobile, right? It's quite, it's got a lot better, uh, but it's still not pervasive. And so just understanding those use cases, understanding that through the full use of the product uh, and the user experience is really important to understanding how you rethink and, and reevaluate the features, the actual implementation of those of the capabilities within the product. 
So in some sense, Raj, you, you, you made the boldest move, which is let's do a calendar-centric uh, innovation, right? This, this calendar is something that everybody uses. It's, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, so walk us through sort of your, the innovation that you are bringing to market using sort of the calendar as the entry point. And, and how so very, very mobile specific thing that you've done here. So, uh, yeah, uh, so some, just sort of a thought experiment is uh, uh, how many mobile first companies are out there that have sort of achieved like the billion dollar valuation, right? So there's marketplaces, uh, Uber, um, I don't know, before Poshmark is, et cetera. And then there's uh, uh, messaging apps like Snapchat and WhatsApp. It's interesting because what's fascinating, uh, and there's an interesting Twitter thread about this, I think, I don't know if it was this past weekend or last week, but um, uh, these, these companies don't even have a website. Uh, which is kind of fascinating uh, in that they're truly mobile first. Uh, Foursquare started truly mobile first, but increasingly has a web destination. So just things to think about. Uh, in, in our world, um, there's a lot of things at play. When you think about mobile, some one of the big challenges, obviously, beyond just sort of discoverability and acquisition is retention. Um, and so uh, when I think about retention, I, when I think about apps in general, uh, you're either uh, replacing an existing experience that's on the device uh, so it's a core utility or productivity app or browser or whatever it is, uh, or you're, you're building a new app that they rely upon. And, and just, just a way to sort of frame it, especially when you think about mobile first, because uh, a lot of those apps that you probably have installed on your phone are extensions of a web experience that you're already using or addicted to. Uh, so uh, uh, in our world, uh, uh, we thought uh, it, it would be better, you know, it's all about creating habit. I think the book uh, the other Raj here was referring to is the book that Nier's writing, where he's talking about variable rewards. Uh, but it's about creating habit, habit forming, habit forming behaviors or habit forming uh, product, uh, and so uh, uh, you know the retention or fickleness. After three days, you forget something, it goes away, and you delete it. And that's just the vast majority. And if you look at these curves out of flurry, it's pretty, it's pretty disastrous uh, <laughs> uh, when you try to intermobile uh, such an uphill climb that it might be. So uh, we felt that the you know we looked at address book, we looked at email, we looked at calendar, we looked at to dos, we looked at sort of different sort of insertion points and where we could try to bring in a system kind of experience. And we felt that the calendar, uh, because it had a built-in notification mechanism, uh, was a way for us to ride sort of notifications without having to be noisy. Uh, uh, and you know, there's a, Chamont talks about in growth hacking that you know, it's all a bunch of BS really, what it is is just alias for spam. Uh, and so it's how can you drive more push notifications, how can you drive more email. Uh, and, and there's some truth to that. And uh, uh, so that, that's sort of the approach we took. Now, if you take a more companion approach, it's interesting because uh, because what you'll find is a number of these apps will ultimately then bring a web version because they're you know you'll sometimes hear this sort of cliche uh, uh, webs for acquisition, mobiles for engagement, uh, and so sort of different ways to think about the problem. So I don't know. Absolutely, you look at Mary Meeker's graph. Mobile is like overtaking web. So uh, certainly, mobile first is definitely the way to go. I'm curious to see. Uh, to what extent that the top 100 sort of mobile apps continue to build web experiences. So I'm curious to see if there's an increasing number of mobile first apps that don't have a web experience at all, uh, and does that sustain itself? Mobile is also interesting in that it's afforded a whole new set of business models, uh, which has been dif more difficult to do over the web, which I think is interesting. Uh, just the fact that you have a credit card, credit card cached already there, uh, something we never really were able to achieve, like a unified payment uh, sort of on the web. So. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm in kind of I'm in the bullish uh, camp. I'm just going to wait and see and see how this sort of plays out. Excellent. So uh, now to just to um, get your thoughts on random random topics. So maybe I will have each of you talk about a trend that you think is not being talked about enough. That you know, there's lots of hype about lots of things, but tell, tell me one thing that you think should get more attention in, uh, in mobile. I can start. Um, before coming here, I actually did some numbers um, on the revenues that uh, Apple is getting from iTunes Store, you know, iTunes and App Store and iBook Store. So they're getting about $20 billion a year. Uh, so that's the money that they're actually earning from selling the content. Um, then I wanted to actually look at Spotify uh, because uh, it's very popular among the youngsters. Um, they actually give away music for free. Uh, on desktop, and then when you want to actually lis listen to it on mobile, then actually they charge you. Uh, but the problem is that a lot of the youngsters are actually listening to Spotify when they're doing homework or when they're studying or when they're coding. Uh, so I think a lot of the users are 
for free only. I was just looking at the numbers. Um, so uh, Apple is making about $20 billion a year from uh, selling content. Spotify right now actually is making about 435 euros a year, uh, which is interesting. Um, very small, but I mean, it's still interesting. Uh, it's uh, 435, sorry, sorry. For 435 million euros. Um, um, and Pandora is making about $125 million a year. So still, I mean, it seems still, you know, people want to actually uh, own music or own content in, instead of actually uh, kind of renting uh, on Spotify because the moment you stop subscription on Spotify, it goes away. But I think this is one of the uh, more interesting um, battles to watch over the years. So from my perspective, I think uh, there is a lot of, especially when you look at retail and commerce in general, there's a lot of focus on consumer. Right? Sometimes I think it's overdone. You know, consumers sometimes say, okay, enough now, right? But I think there is a, on the back end side, the back end processes that businesses, small and large, uh, that fall into applications, mobile apps that would fall into the enterprise productivity sort of the bucket. I, I think there, there's huge room for it. I think that's still untapped and even companies themselves, when they look at some of these applications, and there are not many out there. Uh, I personally think, I think there's a huge room, great opportunity there. Uh, I think that's one of the untapped not being to answer your question, not being so tapped in or talked about areas that uh, I think there is a room, a lot of room for improvement actually there. I, I think one of the key areas, we're, we're sort of, like, as I keep talking about, sort of the, these, these waves, and you have to deal with sort of these first order problems before you can deal with the, with the later ones. I, I, I do think that, at least in the enterprise space, uh, there's still a tremendous amount of headroom in and around uh, providing true mobile-first experiences for an enterprise around workflow and, and, and actually around a lot of the, the, the structured data uh, and applications that are, that are currently in place in many of these organizations. We know that many of those have been web-enabled in recent years, but they tend to still be siloed. They tend not to have been sort of opened up, and there aren't actually a lot of good uh, connections between them that are then delivered in a mobile mobile centric way, and I think that we'll see we'll see that more in the in the coming years. The more of that sort of coming together, it's more of an integration story than anything else. But it's it's fundamentally hard. It, it's like some of the other integration stories we've seen over over recent and, years. And, and John, do you think that comes from enterprise IT? Is it being driven by business, or where do you think that happens? Because especially a company like yours, you know, you have this struggle of trying to sell IT, but really it's, you're solving you're solving the, the business use. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really two part. I mean, as we know, a lot of the the traditional business apps uh, have been uh, many are on prem, and we have many more that are that are now on on the cloud. But they tend to be siloed by their very nature. Um, with more more often on the on the cloud centric ones, we see more open APIs. So we're seeing uh, more extensions to the capability. But now re reimagining that in a mobile centric way uh, hasn't really happened. It's happened in delivering new web experiences and new mashups, I think, on the web side. But we haven't seen it delivered yet in, in mobile. And I think that's really where it's, where it's coming from, uh, or where, where it will happen next. Okay. Yeah, and one of the things we are seeing is, at least the companies we are working with, is there needs to be an internal champion. Companies that have internal champions that understand these silos and that understand these intricacies, those companies are being able to move a lot faster, obviously. They're not so eventually. I think whether it's enterprise IT or or the business or the external vendors, most companies do not have these expert this expertise across. But the ones that do have these champions, they're the ones who are the first adopters. Uh, probably going to sound a little bit cliche. Uh, you hear a lot about big data. Uh, people are collecting a lot of data. Um, I joke with some people that uh, you know we played with AI, artificial intelligence. We now joke that it's actionable intelligence, uh, but it's a uh, uh, just the notion of analyzing data, uh, finally sort of there, I think, um, I don't know if it's a trend people aren't seeing, uh, but uh, uh, just thinking about every app on the phone and imagining w what would a calculator do differently if it was a little bit more anticipatory, or what would a notepad do differently if it was a little bit more anticipatory, or you know, what would your browser do? And you're starting to see this, and then if you combine this with the Internet of Things, 
I think there's some really fascinating experiences in an omnipresent sort of way uh, that, that that's happening. So um, probably stating the obvious. No, no, no. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. So I'll ask one last question for and open up to all of you. Um, each of you think of one company startup that it doesn't have to be super, ideally not super well known. A startup that either you, other than yours, of course, uh, that you think that you think is doing some amazing stuff, great company, love it, or or on the flip side, something you, that you read about got funded. You think you know what was what were those VCs thinking funding that? <laughs> Bonehead idea. So, either one. If you're feeling positive, choose the one you like. If you're feeling negative, choose the one you think is a dumb idea. So, I mean, one of my favorites, of course, uh, it's a very well known company now, uh, is Square. Uh, they, they basically said, you know, we, we want to uh, process transactions. And, you know, there was this big 800 pound gorilla called PayPal in the, uh, in this market space. Uh, and I think even Anderson Horowitz actually passed on them, even though it was Jack Dorsey who actually went uh, to them. Uh, it was a mistake, I mean, they admitted later. Um, and they have done a wonderful job, and they definitely recognized the shift that was happening. This phone was there, and they actually created this device that actually goes in the speaker uh, thing, and then you, know, you can actually process the transaction. So that was an amazing example. I think you're asking. Uh, positive, I think you're asking, I think you're asking, uh, what are some obscure apps that I use that I like? Um, uh, so one I use is Bond. I don't know if you heard of Bond. It's pretty cool. It's a gift giving app, uh, it, it, but it gives handwritten notes. Uh, so I think uh, sort of a comeback of giving gifts after you meet somebody or uh, after somebody does a favor and it sends a handwritten note. Uh, so I think that's kind of cool. Um, I use Spot Setter. Uh, so I have this long tail of cool things I use. So it's similar to Sosh. I don't know if you've seen Sosh or Now. Uh, which is very much about what's around me, but it's more uh, social signal based. Uh, so based on what your uh, friends are doing. Um, I use my like, favorite is Tempo. Though. There you go. <laughs> Tempo fan. I use uh, All the Cook. I don't know if you've seen All the Cooks. Uh, so they um, uh, they have an app on Glass. Um, I'm not sure how many people uh, have played with Glass, but but uh, it's a recipe app and it gives you directions. So while you're wearing your Google Glass, you can see the directions and your hands are free. Uh, and it's super awesome for holidays. Uh, so, uh, just, uh, oh, just somebody, I mean, I have a long list, but sharing with you. So from my perspective, I'll stick to the retail side. Um, it's the, the few companies, and there are a couple here that, um, that we've engaged with, and actually a couple of pilots back in India too. A company called Yetmi back in India, Zobi.com here, actually based in Marin, and I can join. What we are seeing that they are doing different in retail space is traditionally the big, whether it's Gap or I'm not trying to put anyone on it, the process has been across the industry, it takes six months for them to think through a line, to design it, and then launch it. So right now, it's December, they're thinking through what are they gonna have in their stores in uh, summer of next year, right? These companies have actually broken that mold and say, how can we get it from concept to the market within 30 days? So to me, in retail, new products, especially where four out of five products fail in retail, that to me is innovative in its own way. I'm gonna take a not, not so small one. Um, I, I'm, I tend to be a big fan of, of Evernote, I think uh, mostly because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big UX fan. And I, I think as a company, particularly in mobile, who's actually been around for longer than most people can remember, um, or that they'll admit to, um, you know, while I may not sit down and, and, and craft a, a 40 slide PowerPoint presentation on a mobile device, Evernote's done a really good job of catching sort of the, the wave of how do I capture sort of those snippets and notes. This is something that's very, very um, uh, natural on, a, on either a smartphone or a, or, or a tablet-based device. And I think they've done a good job and they continue to innovate and, and, and add to the product offering. Uh, and I think it's, it's been interesting to watch them as a company as they've sort of evolved through the different ways uh, as time has gone on. So one last question, very self-serving, but I'll ask you anyway. So all of you are, are entrepreneurs, talk to lots of investors, angel investors, VCs, so on and so forth. What is, uh, in your experience, what is the biggest misconception that investors like myself, who aren't actually doing anything for a living, uh, what is the biggest misconception, misconception about mobile that they have? Uh, 
you know, you know. <laughs> I'm still thinking. <coughs> Biggest misconception about bubbles. Let me go first. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about misconception, but I think uh, there is a, a well-founded fear today uh, that uh, it's not like you build and they will come. I think the problem, the biggest problem right now in mobile is uh, discovery and whether, you know, when people actually download your app, whether they would continue to actually uh, use it. Uh, but then, you know, somebody has to solve their problem and uh, a lot of the companies actually have gone on to become very addicting apps. And I think that's one reason why I think a lot of the investors actually miss out on a lot of uh, mobile apps. Um, I think uh, I think this is still I think the verdict's still out. I think people are trying to figure out whether they can make money on mobile. Uh, so there was a ton. If you look at it from a investment to ROI sort of return ratio, I think there was a ton of investment into consumer mobile over the last two three years, and uh, there's been some hits, and people are thinking of it in a hit driven way. Uh, and so it, it's really fascinating how that sort of changed the dynamics of even funding uh, between seed and the Series A crunch. Um, uh, but uh, um, I, I've been doing mobile when it, wasn't, when it was called wireless and obviously a fan of the business model and believe that, that, that that's where you're going to see the next sort of wave of billion dollar companies, not, not from the web uh, and desktop, but, but uh, I don't think everybody agrees with that. So I think uh, um, there's a lot of folks that think mobile is a piece of a bigger story where web is really the first experience. So I'd be curious to see as we have more examples of marketplaces and other sorts of things, how that plays out. So I think on the retail side, uh, mobile is growing. Even today, as Vipin mentioned earlier, uh, web is up. Even though the overall, I think the this was a Wall Street Journal today, the overall retail numbers for the, for the weekend were slightly down. The traffic was up overall. And obviously, e-commerce and mobile e-commerce, I think, is close to 40%. And mobile itself, compared to last year, uh, was up 22% based on the numbers that we saw earlier today. Uh, I think there are still some uh, challenges and pitfalls around security. Uh, there are still some issues around, uh, because it's not, I don't think it's just going to be up and up. I think there's going to be the industry, especially retailers, and a lot of them that we talked to today, even there is, they're a little bit hesitant of fully jumping in. Yes, they have mobile apps that they want to sell on mobile, and if you look at the numbers, even the retailers that have specific mobile apps for the smartphones that want to sell on and, uh, uh, using the smartphones, they're close to, I think it's a low 20s. So while, and part of it is due to many reasons, but I think when you think through uh, beyond just the traditional, I don't know if it was the next panel, uh, beyond the traditional commerce that, that's being generated from mobile, I think the adoption and um, and the maturity, more and more the adoption, the maturity is going to be, I think it's going to take a little bit longer than currently we anticipate. Yeah, I don't know if I have too much more to add. I, I think, I think the, the, maybe one of the insights is, is uh, that particularly for, for enterprise mobile, uh, it, it continues to be a very challenging space because it, it does require so many different skill sets. Um, as, as enterprise always has. And I think what happens in many cases is people assume it's mobile, I can put three smart people in a room, give them a little bit of money and they'll come up with something cool and it'll work. <laughs> I, I think the answer is it will work in a first order, but, but it may not be deployable in a large enterprise. And, and I think uh, sort of one of the realizations is, is really understanding sort of what's required for the whole, the whole product, the whole solution. <laughs> This is, this is something that's been true for every startup, mobile or not, but, but uh, it's worth pointing out for mobile again. <laughs> one last very quick one, actually. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the investors uh, are giving a lot of credibility, I think, to what's hot with youngsters. And uh, there may be you know, some things where they're actually right, um, uh, but there may actually be some instances where it may not actually pan out to be true. Uh, Snapchat you know, being one example, but there are some others uh, and you know, time will you know tell us whether we are still again kind of in 99.com phase where eyeballs matter and uh, revenue model, or whether you know, like there was an app called Draw Something, which was actually very very popular about a year ago, and then it got bought by Zynga, and then their numbers just tank. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have time for questions? Let's take a few questions. Yeah, please. So the question is, we have talked a lot about UX, but we have stayed away from technology. 
but how does HTML5 compare to uh, writing in uh, native mode? I mean, you know, since you've touched on UX, so the general question is, has HTML5 reached a point where if you're not gaming and you know you don't really worry about basic performance, but in terms of overall presentation, uh, that has reached a stage that we should write only for HTML5 and not for the iOS or Android or yeah, great question. Um, I'll take a stab at it. Um, from my perspective, HTML5, um, I, I actually don't see um, a lot of the consumer uh, app developers developing in HTML5. Uh, because even when you're actually going down to native APIs, when you're actually working with iOS, there are many things that you actually want to do, and you actually are not able to do in your application. Uh, so you, know, you always wait for the next version of the OS. So when you actually get down to HTML, uh, I think the kind of experience that you're able to provide is not optimal for you know uh, either the iOS people or for Android people. So um, at least in the consumer space, uh, that has not been a real success. Uh, so I think there's some good uh, cross-platform development tools. Uh, I think obviously based on your application, but things like Accelerator, there's others. Um, uh, and, and you do see a lot of uptake of these tools for internal applications, or UI isn't necessarily the, UX and UI isn't the number one priority, it's like the number two priority, uh, but rapid sort of development and cost to build is like more important. Um, I don't, uh, it, there's two famous like kind of semi-flops, right? So there's the LinkedIn app, which uh, took three years to ship uh, because they did the first version in HTML5 and they talked about how they regretted it. Uh, and then there's Mark Zuckerberg who said, the biggest mistake he made at Facebook was using HTML5 on mobile. Uh, and so that, that's created a lot of negative sentiment uh, when people think about HTML5. I'm increasingly seeing people uh, render natively and maybe use some kind of server logic to then uh, signal uh, um, uh, the data that should be rendered and what the UI should look like. Uh, so it's kind of somewhere in between like homegrown hybrid model uh, or using a cross-platform development tool. but. Uh, um, I, I don't, uh, I think it took a long time on the web before we have, we're almost at the point where we've gotten rid of all plugins. Uh, but we're still not there. I mean, it took like a long time, like 20 years. So I guess that's sort of the question. When, the, when is that gonna happen on mobile? On the enterprise side, the apps we've developed and the ones that we're helping our customers with, we're staying away from HTML5 for now. Staying away. I actually like HTML5. I actually think that there is no right platform. You really have to figure out what you're trying to deliver and then figure out the right platform decision after that. Um, HTML5 for us doesn't provide, similar to others, uh, things like the, the security APIs, being able to store things and, and handle offline use cases. So there are a lot of limitations in HTML5 for that type of an app, but there are other kinds of apps that will work perfectly well with HTML5. a lot about uh, startups doing like, like creating tools or discovery for um, other media or content that's not online, but who's actually like doing a startup around creating this content or creating a mobile media to begin with? I mean, everyone can you know, create tools to discover something someone else made, but you know, how do you actually create a startup around actually making it? Yeah, just to repeat the question, are, you know, what, what kinds of companies out there doing content authoring tools for mobile? Right? It's not, not tools, actually making the content. Oh, actual actually, content like, creation. You know, actually, yeah, like, you know, production company. Like, I have a production company in LA. I'm wondering, like, who's doing it up here? You know, like, I see lots of, like, you know, I, obviously IT people up here. You know, but, like, who's actually creating all this content everyone's discovering? Yeah, any thoughts on that? I have a thought on it. Yeah, you wouldn't actually... Uh, I mean, Bitcovery, for example, again, is the kind of company which actually helps users discover content. And what we mean by content is ebooks, apps, uh, music, uh, movies. Um, actually, Silicon Valley definitely is a lot weaker um, in terms of creation of content. Um, and I think LA is probably the place where there is a lot of content that is being created. Uh, There's um, not like one company up here that. No, I mean, there are some small, uh, you know, uh, agencies or there are some small boutique uh, production houses. Uh, and it is, I mean, uh, like for example, we are part of a mobile accelerator called Tandem, a mobile accelerator, and there is a, one of the portfolio companies called Tile, 
which is you know this device that you actually put with your keychain or something, and you know you can find it if it gets lost. Uh, I mean, they worked with uh, an individual uh, person who actually created that video, uh, which actually they advertise a lot, and I believe it's a public information that they actually got three million dollars in pre-orders using that video. But I mean, if you actually look at it, I mean, it's, it's a you know it's a very useful functional video. But if you actually compare it with any content that is actually created in LA, it is amateurish. Uh, so I mean, definitely, you know, Silicon Valley could benefit by working with people who are coming from LA. <laughs> On the retail side, there are when you look at especially products, which is what we deal with. It, there, there's two type of content. One is the creative content, where there's the product video, and all the research we've done so far is basically showing for the same product, if customers are looking at the same product on two different sites, the site that has a better product will actually get the same, 90% of the time. So, so companies like, for example, eBay is one example, they outsource the content creation, even the descriptions that, that you see when you search on eBay or even on Amazon, they're outsourcing, they're, they're, so they're, 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 they're companies that are looking at these descriptions, comparing them to the competitor site who are selling the same or similar product, and cleaning up those descriptions too, cleaning up of images, cleaning up of videos, and our company, we don't create content, but our platform enables this workflow. So uh, I have some names that, but they are more from the perspective of commerce and retail, rather than creating creative content. So there are some companies in Bay Area that do focus on content authoring. Uh, there is a company called Byliner, uh, and they have taken uh, a different approach to uh, your digital content. So they create short form content, which is ideal for mobile mobile consumption. So they have the relationship with authors and uh, the publishers, where they have access to uh, all the content that is not uh, it's not out of print, but it's not the current, uh, and. And they encourage the authors to create short form content out of the content that they published earlier. So create a steady stream of content which you can consume in bite sizes on mobile devices. It's a very unique take on the content creation and consumption, which is again, uh, mobile first. Because you have a few minutes to kill, uh, where you open your phone or you, or you have a tablet, and you launch it, read, read some content, and, and be done. So there are some, some models, very interesting models and companies that are focusing on mobile first content uh, creation, that is. Uh, and I, I wanted to add about, of course, uh, you know, Zynga's of the world, Zynga, Electronic Arts, uh, Pixar, uh, and of course, George Lucas, uh, ILM, I mean, they're all based here. So I, I definitely didn't want to forget them. <laughs> so I think we should break for, for dinner, Raj. Anyway, uh, I learned a lot. Thank you very much to all the panelists. And, uh, Thank you, Raj.